Hi, welcome. In this session, I want to talk again about how flexible intrinsic valuation is and how it can be used to value things that most people give up on. In particular, I want to talk about the value of people or a key person to a business. Now, in private company valuation, key person valuation has always been part of the game. Value of plumbing practice, a medical practice, a dental practice, a small business. The question that always gets asked by an appraiser is, what happens to the value of this business the key person leaves? There you apply discounts to value called a key person discount. The presumption is that as companies get bigger, they get more and become public companies, this doesn't matter as much anymore. But is that true? Can key people still make a difference at big companies? Just in the last few weeks, we've had answers to those questions in terms of three big stories. The first, of course, was the OpenAI mess. OpenAI, technically a non-profit, has been priced or valued at $80 billion, given its potential to become a for-profit organization. A few weeks ago, the board of directors at OpenAI fired Sam Altman, who'd been the face of the company, raised capital for the company, and in effect had raised, set the narrative for the company. That didn't end well because within a week, the board had been fired and Sam Altman was back. Why? Partly because the entire company would have come apart without him, a key person. The second story is a much more long-standing one. Tesla. As long as Tesla has been in existence, one man has dominated the landscape for the company. Now, and Elon Musk. At least early in the company's life, Elon Musk was viewed as an unmitigated plus, somebody who pushed up the value of the company. But in the last year or two, there's been debate about whether he adds more or takes away more from the company. But clearly, he, his presence or absence makes a difference to Tesla's valuation. And finally, just in the last couple of weeks, you probably read the sad news that Charlie Munger passed away. At the ripe age of 99, but he and, Ch and Warren Buffett represented a duo that carried the value one company, Berkshire Hathaway, for more than four or five decades. Clearly, big companies where individual, an individual or individuals made a difference to the value. So let's think about who a key person can be. And as I start describing potential key people, you're going to see this, this, this span the spectrum. Now, obviously, when we talk about key people, you might, you might as well start at the top. Founders and CEOs are often viewed as key people. Now, they can add or destroy the value of a company by behaving well or badly. Now, if you keep going, though, it's not just at the top that you find key people. You can find them all over the organization. If you're a pharmaceutical company, if you have a great research scientist on your staff who is responsible for turning in a blockbuster drug, that person could account for a big chunk of your value. Apple, one person, John Ive, who's responsible for the design of many of Apple's most popular devices, became viewed as somebody who was as a key person driving the value of Apple as a company. If you're a selling company, a salesperson or a group of salespeople can account for a big chunk of your value. Why? Because they bring in new clients and their client relationships are what deliver the revenues and profits for you. Now, for human capital design companies, consulting firms, companies built around human capital, it is entirely possible that a manager or an employee that cultivates relationships with people, customers, suppliers, employees, could be key to the value of a company. And finally, a key person in some organizations might be somebody who doesn't work for the organization but comes from outside. This is especially true when you use a celebrity or a so spokesperson to become the face of your company. In each of these cases, though, the key person can add to value or destroy value depending on what they bring to the company or take away. So that's a who. Now, what the effect of key person is on value I'm going to, is, a, is a question that you can answer using a framework that those of you who read my previous post should be pretty, pretty familiar with. I may be a one-trick pony. But from my perspective, for something to show up in value, it's got to show up in the numbers. In particular, here are the drivers of value of any business. The cash flows are driven by revenue growth that, that captures the growth component of your business. 
operating margins over time that captures the profitability of your business and how much the company will have to reinvest to get that growth that captures the investment efficiency of the business. Everything the company does from a business perspective has to show up in one of those three inputs and through those into cash flows. If you go below the line, you see the effects on risk, either as a risk-adjusted discount rate with, com- with businesses with, with more operating risk having higher discount rates or as a failure risk. I'm going to argue that any key person to affect value has to find a way to affect one or more of these numbers. So if you take a key CEO or a founder, the job, in my view, of a CEO or a founder is to set the narrative for the company, the story that's going to drive how people think about the company. That story affects everything. It affects growth and margins and reinvestment and risk. So a top a top person CEO or a key CEO or a key founder can, in a sense, affect every aspect of value and by large amounts. Now, in the case of OpenAI, you could argue that if Sam Sam Altman would have left, the value of of OpenAI as as an enterprise could have dropped from 80 billion to close to nothing. Now, if you look at a key key salesperson, the key salesperson's effect will be primarily through either the level of sales or through growth in sales because they bring in new customers and clients. If you look at a key spokesperson, a celebrity, there again, the effects are going to be primarily through sales. Having a celebrity spokesperson who can bring in their following to buy your products and push up sales. A key designer or research person, their effects are going to be more in product design and and production and through that, through margins and value, though they could have effects on sales as well. And a key production person, somebody who manages your factories, your plant, your equipment, your supply chain, their effects will be seen primarily through margins and how much you reinvest. Now, I teach finance and I tell my finance students sheepishly that of all of the people in an organization, the people who are least likely to be key people are finance people because in a sense they're replicable. But there are cases where you can have a key finance person. What does a key finance person do? By managing the mix of debt and equity, they could reduce your dis- your cost of capital, you know, also known as your discount rate. Or they can also affect your failure risk. In fact, some finance people are adept at raising capital. And by raising capital, lining up source of capital, they can reduce failure risk and reduce your discount rate. Now, obviously, I haven't touched on every conceivable key person, but my recommendation is if you can think of a key person, work it through this framework to see what the effect on value will be. Now, the question might be, well, now that we know how a key person can affect value, how do we put a number on a key person? The first and the most comprehensive way of valuing a key person is to value a business twice. Once with the key person in it and the effects that key person has on growth and margins and reinvestment and risk and once without. The difference between those two values will be the value of the key person. That obviously is not just a lot of work but requires that you identify how a key person affects each of the inputs. Now if you don't have the time or the resource to do it, there's a second approach. You can try to estimate a replacement cost. This, will, this is effective especially if you have a key person who affects one or a couple of inputs. If you have a great research scientist or a great design person and you're worried about that person leaving or you lose that person, you can look at what it would cost you to get a replacement for that person. It's obviously more difficult when you have a key person whose effects are more diffuse, more difficult to capture and more difficult to replace. In some cases, there are key people that you can insure against. Insurance companies then, in return for a premium, offer to pay you a compensating amount. Obviously, you've got to come up with that compensating amount, but to the extent that you can buy insurance against the loss of key people, that then becomes a number you can put into your valuation as a cost, reduces your cash flows, and you value the company. And in effect, you've smoothed out the effect of the key person by buying insurance against that person's loss. Now, there are some implications by thinking about key person valuation in a systematic way. The first is, as you think about the value of a key person, 
as being the difference in the value of the company with and value without, you can see that the value of a key person can vary widely across companies. We'll come back and look at some of those determinants, but the value of a key person can vary widely across companies. Second, while the notion of a key person is often viewed as a positive, increasing value, key people can reduce value. They have influence on cash flows, but the influence can be a negative one. So the effect on value can be positive and negative. And finally, the effect of a key person can vary over time. A key person who adds value to a business at one point in time can over time become value destructive. We'll talk about it in the context of a life cycle, but the right, a, a key person who adds to the value of a young company can very quickly become a liability as the company becomes larger. Now that's evaluation focus on key person. But as you know, I make contrast between valuing something and pricing something. So let's talk about how key people are priced in, in different contexts. I talked about how in private business valuation, there's a key person discount. That key person discount is, is often 10, 15, 20%. And, and, and Shannon Pratt, one of the legendary names in private business valuation and in his original book on valuing closed and firms, firms and private business suggests the discount be between 10 and 25 percent though he left that choice often in the hands of the appraiser now i don't mean to speak ill of private company private company pricing but in many cases key price uh, key person pricing in private businesses has become a legal question rather than a valuation question where how much you discount for a key person is often determined by what courts allow or will not allow rather than by valuation first principles. So key person pricing happens in private businesses, but I'm not sure the numbers that you see actually reflect anything real. If you look at public companies, you do see a key person effect, at least in hindsight. And this is particularly true in the studies that look at CEO departures. In particular, if you look at CEO debts, and those debts are unexpected, you're getting a market reaction to the loss of potentially a key person. In the HBO hit series Succession, towards, uh, and I hope I'm not giving anything away in, in case you haven't seen the entire series, Logan Roy, the patriarch of the family and the CEO, dies towards the end of this, uh, the series. And when he dies, the, the company that he controls, it's a family control company, it's a publicly traded company, Waystar Royco, drops about 10, 12%, drops precipitously. Now that's fiction and it's per perhaps exaggerated for a dramatic effect, but in practice there are CEOs who die and the question is how does the market react to that? And looking across studies, the, result is, the results are mixed. Now one study that looked at 240 companies where CEOs died between 1950 and 2009 found that in about half the cases the stock price went up on the death of a CEO. Now and the reactions tended to be more negative with underperforming CEOs and more positive with highly regarded ones and the impact of and, and one of the interesting things about this study and we'll come back and talk about this later was the impact on market prices of CEO debts was far greater in the later time periods than in the earlier ones. In other words, in 2000 through 2009, the impact was far greater than in the 1950s or 60s. In a different study of CEO debts, the, uh, the study found that the market reaction tended to be much more, you know, much greater, you know, for longer tenure, you know, much more positive. You know, for longer tenured CEOs and badly perform, uh, performing firms, which suggests that markets are looking forward to change and longer tenured CEOs have more changes needed and therefore a bigger effect on value. CEOs also re get replaced or retired. If you look at CEO force replacement, you're looking at a bias sample. This is a sample of companies where CEOs are being forced out because they haven't done a good job. In other words, they key people who are value destructive. So one way to think about what the market reaction tells us is how much value that key person was destroying. Fairly or unfairly, stock prices tend to go up when CEOs are forced to retire, they're, they're fired. 
though the effect on value, the, the effect, the market reaction tends to be much more positive if an outsider is brought in to replace that fired CEO than insider, which again is is um, supportive of the notion that companies are looking for change. CEO retirements are, in a sense, the more the, the grayest area because CEOs can retire, good CEOs can retire, bad CEOs can retire. On average, the market reaction is pretty neutral. You know? But if you look across companies, you, si- you see that you know, age-related departures, you get a mildly negative reaction. And they tend to be market reaction tends to be much more positive, as I said, when an outsider is brought in to replace the CEO than when it's somebody inside the firm. Finally, there, is, uh, there are at least case studies of what happens to stock prices when a celebrity or a spokesperson meets a bad end or gets into, it gets into some kind of crisis. Now, one of the more famous uh, cases for this is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, as you all know, you know, took over the game of golf, made it popular beyond any prior golfer in history, and in the process became a spokesperson for a multitude of companies. He had some personal problems that eventually went, went public, leading to him having to cut strings with all of the companies that he was a spokesperson with. Now, one study looked at five companies, Accenture, Nike, Gillette, Electronic Arts, and Gatorade, where he had significant connections, and looked at what happened in their market capitalizations when Tiger Woods had his personal problems. And they collectively lost about 2 to 3% of the market cap. See, that's not much. That's about 5 to 12 billion in market cap loss, because one person had personal problems. In an earlier episode, Nike had, um, had Michael Jordan as a spokesperson and beyond just being a spokesperson, he also had affixed his name to one of Nike's best-selling shoes, the Air Jordan. And in 1993, out of nowhere, Michael Jordan announced that he was retiring from basketball and becoming a baseball player. On the day that he announced it, Nike lost billions in market cap. And finally, just in 2023, if you've been following the National Football League, you, know, you probably are, are aware of the Taylor Swift effect. Taylor Swift you know, has, been, uh, has, been, has been going out with Travis Kelsey, um, a Kansas City uh, football player. And in the process, she has done wonders for the NFL. It's increased their ratings by drawing in women, especially young women watchers who would historically haven't been big football watchers. This might be just a Taylor Swift buzz, but it'll be interesting to see if the most valuable person in the NFL is not uh, Patrick Mahomes, who's uh, the, the, one of the higher profile quarterbacks in the game, or Roger Goodell, who's, um, who, who is um, the commissioner, but Taylor Swift. But put simply, you know, you can, you can see key people having effects on value in public companies. Now, given that key people can affect value, companies have looked for ways to manage the risk of key people. And there are a variety of choices. None of them are perfect, but you know, some companies can use them. For small businesses, very dependent on a key person, and especially when that key person's effects are clearly identifiable in sales or in costs, you can buy insurance. But recognize that when you buy insurance against losing a key person, what you're doing is smoothing out value. In what way? Well, paying the insurance premium would reduce your profits in the period where the key person is still around. So you'll become less profitable in the periods where the key person is present. But because you'll get a payout if the key person leaves, it'll potentially increase value in periods where the key person is gone. So it smooths out value. Second, and one of the things that many smaller business leads worry with key, worry about with key people is that they will not only leave, but they will go join a competitor or start their own businesses. So many companies with key people working for them negotiate no compete clauses, where essentially those key people, if they leave, cannot compete with them. You still have the loss because of the loss of the key person, but it's it isn't made worse by that key person becoming a competitor. The third, and this is especially true in personal service businesses like medical practices and dental practices, the seller of the practice, a doctor or a dentist, will agree to stay on 
even as a new even as a new doctor or dentist buys the practice and effectively by having an overlapping tenure you're trying to reduce the loss of people patients who might have left the practice because you've left so you, you have that overlapping tenure and finally in publicly traded companies there are two ploys or two approaches to reducing key person risk one is the key person can start building a team and trying to educate the team on the skills that they have and to the extent that they can pass us on pass their skills on they're making themselves less indispensable more dispensable because that team can do what they do in the case of a key person like a ceo or a top manager having a successor pick that you train who's ready to step in when you leave in effect is making you a less valuable key person as you as, as you see uh, hear me say that you you're probably saying but why would a key person ever develop a team or prepare a successor if it makes that key person less valuable and here's the conundrum the most valuable key people to an organization are those people who not only add value while they're there but work very hard to make themselves less valuable over time and from the key person standpoint here's the trade off it is true that by training a team or preparing a successor you're making yourself less key but you're making yourself less key in a more valuable organization and to the extent that you own a stake in that more valuable organization you may come out ahead I mean I am not a Microsoft fan but I have always admired the way Bill Gates walked away from Microsoft in 2000 when he retired in 2000 Micro- Bill Gates was he was a relatively young man he left Microsoft he was on the board of directors but never once in the years after did i see him second guessing steve bomber or satya nadella and what they did now he effectively made himself dispensable in an organization that he was viewed as very much key to the organization by the same token jeff bezos you know i know we see him in speedos on a yacht in europe and in tabloid stories but you got to admire the fact that Jeff Bezos built Amazon to be the 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 monstrosity of a company it is and left it to the management team that he trusted enough that he could wear speedos and end up on a yacht you know so the very best key people make ways to find themselves dispensable but they make themselves dispensable in an organization that becomes more valuable The interesting question with Tesla is whether Elon Musk will be able to do it because you're looking at a company that is, you know, he is a, he is mortal and to the extent that you're building a trillion dollar company that does amazing things you want to prepare that company for a time when you're not around and time will tell whether Musk is up to that task. So let's talk a little bit about the determinants of key person value. In particular why are key people worth more in some companies than others i'm going to suggest four things that can explain the differences one is a very simplistic one the size of the company as a company gets bigger it becomes more and more difficult for individual or an individual or a few individuals to make a difference in its value the second is life cycle it turns out that key people have more value in young companies than in mature companies and they have less value in mature companies than in declining ones as a strange u-shaped curve where the value of a key person drops off as a company matures and then rises again in decline i'll talk about why now companies can also be micro or macro companies in micro companies the value of a business is driven by choices the company makes in macro companies the value of the business is driven by things outside the business commodity prices the economy and the value of a key person is greater in micro than macro businesses and finally if you're a value investor you know the value of moats comparative advantages companies with strong long standing sustainable moats key people are worth less in those companies than in companies where you have tra- transitory moats where you got to keep working to preserve those moats start with company size as a company gets bigger just the scaling up makes each individual person less valuable 
So if you're a super star trader in a small trading house with 10 traders, you have a much bigger impact and value than if you're a super star, star trader at Goldman Sachs. Clearly exceptions to this rule though, because as uh, the three examples that I gave, OpenAI, uh, Tesla and Berkshire Hathaway are all huge company, um, at least the latter two are big companies, and they still had value determined, determined by an individual or individuals. Second, and as many of you know, I have this obsession with a corporate life cycle where companies are born, they grow, they mature, and they go into decline. And this framework is actually a very useful one for thinking about at least key CEOs. Yeah. If you think about a CEO's role, it changes as you go through the life cycle. Early on, the CEO has to be a storyteller. You know, as you get bigger, you've got to be a business builder. You know, I've used the, the, phenom the terminology of Steve, the, the visionary, Bob, the builder. And then as you get to be a mature company, your, your job as a CEO is to play defense. And then in decline, you've got to be somebody who's willing to oversee the liquidation of your company. I'm going to argue that the value of a CEO, the, you know, in good ways and bad ways, is greatest at young companies. A founder CEO in a startup can make or break the company in the way they frame their narrative. That, that importance will still remain as you become a young company. You've got to build a company, but it'll decrease as you approach maturity. In fact, it'll, it'll, hit an, it'll hit a bottom when you are a mature, stable company, where in effect, the company runs itself. Now, it doesn't mean you can't create damage. And then decline, you've got, you get a reawakening of why the CEO matters, because in decline, you've got to actively take actions that nobody likes you for to make the company a smaller company. So if you think about where a company is in the life cycle, you can already get some perspective on what a key CEO will look like and how key a key CEO will be at that stage in the life cycle. So uh, the life cycle implications are actually useful to think about the recent events at OpenAI and Tesla. I mean, OpenAI, in spite of its inflated, estimated potential capitalization of 80 billion, is a young, young enterprise, right? It's got 770 employees, they're all working on AI, this technology for the future. And as you well know, the board of directors decided to fire Sam Altman, who had been the face of the company, the, the storyteller for the company, the capital raiser. And soon after he was fired, all heck break, broke loose. The capital providers to um, OpenAI, you know, which included not just venture capital investors, but Microsoft rebelled. The se I think 700 of the 770 employees signed a letter saying they planned to leave OpenAI which left the very real possibility that without Sam Altman's, OpenAI would become just a shell of a company. It's no surprise that within a week, the board was, was gone and Sam Altman was back. So clearly a case of a young company where a person can, for better or worse, was viewed as central to the company. With Tesla, it's a more complex story. Early in its life, it's undeniable that Elon Musk was the company that without him his his vision his force of nature you know th there is no way tesla would have made it to where it is so early in its life you know elon musk was not just a key person but the difference between the company existing and not having a company at all as the company has grown and you got to give elon musk credit for that as well and become not just the face of the electric car business, but change the conversation in the automobile business. Its market cap is Zoom. Briefly hit a trillion dollars in 2021. It's still $700, $800 billion company. It is a large company in terms of market cap. It's becoming a large company in terms of operations. And the debate at least has begun as to whether Elon Musk is the right person for the company. Now, partly because there are some minuses he brings to the game. The fact is, he is distracted. He has multiple companies on his plate. You know, he runs SpaceX. He got Twitter. You know, and uh, and he keeps talking about new businesses he wants to start. He has other distractions. I mean, he is human, and he, with his vision comes a whole set of weaknesses that can affect the value of Tesla as a company. I do believe in my most recent valuation of Tesla where I created two new businesses, the 
or a software business and the robo taxi business that Elon Musk is still a net plus and a big net plus for the company. Now that might change a year from now, five years from now, but this is now a process where we have to think about the pluses and minuses that an Elon Musk brings to Tesla. Let's talk about micro and macro businesses. When you have companies where the bulk of your value comes from a macro variable. My favorite example for this is an oil company, right? You have Royal Dutch Shell. What drives the value of Royal Dutch Shell? Oil prices. Um, it's, um, if you ask me who the CEO of Royal Dutch is, I, my response is I don't know and I don't care. What's he going to do anyway? Come and watch the terminal a little more carefully to see what happens to the oil price. In contrast, if you take a company, an entertainment company like Disney, for better or worse, the choices that Disney makes can make or break the company. In the last three years, they've made more decisions that break than make the company. But it is a company where the key person matters. That key person, if he was Bob Chapek, might have mattered in a negative way. And with Bob Iger, the question is, is he a net positive or a net negative? But he can clearly make a difference because with micro businesses, it's management choices that drive value. And as a consequence, you care who runs the company. And finally, in the context of business modes, competitive advantage, there are some companies with long-standing competitive advantages, which have nothing to do with the management. So if you have a, a competitive advantage that will be there no matter what, question is what does it matter who manages the company so you take a coca-cola whose competitive advantage is a brand name that was created over the last century it's an open question as to whether who runs coca-cola now makes a significant difference to the value of the company in contrast if you have a company where your competitive advantages are transitory right it's very, and, and you have to reinvent yourself every two or three years to keep going. Now, I'm going to argue that management matters more and key people matter more. Take Two, which is an entertainment software company, lives from game to game. Now, and it can be successful this year and be gone in three years if it doesn't keep working. So in general, the more sustainable your competitive advantage is, the more long-standing they are the less key people will matter at that company because the competitive advantages will go on no matter who's running the company. So in general, if you look at the implications of, of this key person value, there are quite a few. The first is key people, and I shouldn't even be saying this, are, are human beings. As human beings, they're going to age. And as they age, it's got to get re the, the key person value is going to be affected. We go back to my Berkshire Hathaway example, where for 60 years, two men, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, have been the faces of the company. Now, you've seen the Berkshire Hathaway meetings and how you know, investors fly from all over the world to not just listen to them, but to value the company with the trust that they will run the company. And if you, if you break down Berkshire Hathaway, and you can accuse me of being simplistic, you have an insurance company in Geico and a closed and mutual fund which is which uses the capital from the insurance company now every insurance company is structured this way but what made Berkshire Hathaway special for much of its life was that its closed and mutual fund was run by the greatest portfolio managers in history in Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger how does it play out you know you'd see the market price of Berkshire Hathaway reflected not just the market caps of all of the companies they own. Remember, it's a closed and mutual fund. You can see what they own. But a premium on top, call it the Buffett Munger premium. Now, both, you know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and, and as Hume are, have aged, and as they've aged, markets have had to factor in that they are less central to the company. In fact, it's not a secret. Now, Warren Buffett and Munger officially passed the baton on to Todd Combs and Ted Wexler and they said those are the guys who are going to be running Berkshire Hathaway stock picking but uh, it's you not know, the the question is whether markets have factor are factoring in the reduced role that these two men have had and especially now that Munger has passed on the even more reduced role that they will have in the future so to capture this here's what I did I went and 
looked up the market cap and book value of equity of of Berkshire Hathaway over time. Remember the book value of equity for Berkshire Hathaway is a mark to market book value of equity because you own Coca-Cola, you own um, Washington Post, which are publicly traded companies. So the red line is the market value, the, the, the green line is the book value. And I've computed the price to book ratio. Now I don't want to read too much into this, but this graph starts in 1993 when Warren Buffett was 63 years old and, Ch and Munger was 69. They were relatively old people, but not old. They were still actively running the company. Now, they're, um, they actually stepped down officially around a decade ago, 2012, 2013. And I don't want to read too much into this. Clearly, price-to-book ratios have dropped and kind of steadied out in the, de in the last decade. In addition, one way to think about the, the Buffett-Munger premium is to compare the price-to-book ratio for Berkshire Hathaway to the price-to-book ratio for insurance companies in the U.S. in the aggregate. And you know what, that premium, which was to be 30% in the 1990s, you now 37% in between 2002 and 2012, 2003 and 2012, has dropped off to about 12%. In fact, in the last few years, it's completely disappeared. There has been no Buffett Munger premium. Markets have clearly factored in the aging, which is one reason when, Char when Charlie Munger died, you didn't see a drop in Berkshire Hathaway's stock price it's already been priced in. It also has implications for how we think about you know, the economy. In the 20th century, the economy was composed of manufacturing and financial service companies dominating. You know, key people had a lesser effect on value, but as the pendulum has, shift, has swung towards technology companies, in the 21st century, you look at the top 10 companies, all companies that are either technology companies or technology driven companies like Nvidia and Tesla. You know, you could argue that key people matter more at these companies given their characteristics. So, if nothing else, you could argue that as we've shifted from a 20th century to 21st century economy, our companies are becoming more dependent on people, sometimes at the top, sometimes at the middle. That has implications for us. Our accounting has not kept, I mean, accounting standards have not kept up with this reality. We do an abysmal job of accounting for human capital. In what way? If you think about human capital as your key asset in a company, the way you make that asset more valuable is by what you invest in human capital, recruiting, training, keeping employees happy. Those expenses, for the most part, are still treated as operating expenses rather than capital expenses. I do think we need to work harder at getting better disclosures on human capital and better ways of assessing how well companies are dealing with their human capital. Now, I still look at company annual reports looking for turnover ratios and key person losses to be highlighted, but they're not. And that, I think, is a failing. On compensation, I think the way economies have, the economy has changed and companies have shifted as implications for compensation. In organizations where there are valuable key, key people, you should expect to see much bigger variations in compensation because after all, to keep the most valuable people, you got to pay them enough to, so that they stay. So you'd expect compensation differences to be greater at those organizations. In addition, because you want those key people to train teams and successes to take over, much of that compensation will take the form of equity because that's the only way the trade-off works for key people to train others to replace them. So it, you know, for, uh, I know from an equity standpoint, people find the divergence in compensation between the best paid and the average employee to be troubling. But that might reflect the reality of, of, of the time, which is in many companies, people, people have become more valuable rather than less so. Now, I don't want to be viewed as an apologist for big CEO packages. By the same token, there are lots of companies, and I've highlighted a few of those, but I don't think it matters who is at, at, atop the company. I highlighted the case of macro-driven companies, companies like Royal Dutch, companies with competitive advantages that basically run the company, like Coca-Cola. 
And in those companies, I've always wondered why CEOs get tens of millions of dollars. Now, this might be a little unfair, but I think in roughly half of the S&P 500 companies, um, an AI generated CEO would do just as good a job as the actual people running these companies. And those companies, I don't think we should be paying those CEOs tens of millions of dollars because I don't see the value that they add at these companies. So in conclusion, there, you know, there are many canards about intrinsic valuation. One of them is that in intrinsic valuation, we don't care about people that were all numbers, numbers, numbers. But where do you think people in a company show up? They show up as numbers. You have good people in a company. They create cash flows. They create growth. They affect risk. And so in reality, intrinsic valuations have always embedded the value of a key person or people in a business. But I think that if you want to separate out that effect, that's going to take some doing, but it can be done. Now, now intrinsic value, though, is not built on nostalgia or emotion. You don't value a key person because he or she has started the company, has been around 40 years. You value that person because of the effect that they have on value. It's um, and it, 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 is, it does open our eyes to the fact that keep the value of key people can vary across companies or vary across time and that um, that we have to think about individual companies and what key people do in them to make final judgments on how much a key person is worth. I hope you found the session useful and I thank you very much for listening.